So welcome to the channel and in this new playlist we're going to be having a look at another great British classic, the Triumph TR6. So in this first episode we're going to be having a look at a buyer's guide for your potential new TR6 purchase. So congratulations, you've made your first choice and that is to buy a TR6. They're fantastic British icons of classic cars. They're fairly easy to work on, there's good parts availability and they're great fun to drive. If you haven't made your choice already, there's four basic models to choose from. Two in the UK and two in the US. In the UK there were two chassis that were made between 1968 and 1975. Initially with the CP variant of chassis that uh, took a 150 brake horsepower engine and then more latterly after 1973 the CR based chassis where the power dropped to 125 brake horsepower. In the US uh, these models are characterised by the carburettor engines, there you have the CF and the CC versions uh, and power for those engines is around 104 brake horsepower. The main difference between the cars is the UK versions had petrol injection versus the US uh, carburettor versions. And then on the model change at around 1973, power dropped in the UK, uh, giving people a little bit more of a preference for the higher power earlier versions. But other than that, it was minor mechanical improvements uh, and cosmetic changes as well. What that means in effect is there's very little to choose from. Uh, each of the versions has their own quirks, has their own market values, and really you have to choose to suit your budget the same rings true for TR6s as most classics. You should generally buy the best that you can afford. Uh, often if you buy a project, the cost of the parts plus the time and the labor will far outstrip what you could have bought a more uh, improved, up-to-date and mechanically sound version for. So buy the best you can afford. If you're not sure which model you can have, you can look at the chassis plates. So for earlier models, you'll find a plate here uh, on the inside front wheel arch. For later models, as this one, you can see we have a plate inside the door closer there. Uh, in terms of engine numbers, if you're not sure about your engine number, you'll find the engine number on the side of the block. On a tab here, it should be stamped here. There are two other plates that you often find on TR6s, and they're located here on the bulkhead. And those are actually internal Triumph plates, typically for body and white and manufacture. Uh, so for ordering parts and for restoration purposes, uh, you don't actually need these numbers. As with all British classics, your number one enemy is rust and rot. Let's take a look on the underneath of the car to start with, with the chassis. First thing you need to look at with any new prospective TR6 purchase is the chassis. The chassis is the heart of the car. It sits as a ladder chassis underneath the bodywork and any rust or rot across the chassis or in a particular area is potentially a body off restoration. This involves a lot of time and potentially a lot of cost. So it may make or break your purchase decision. Let's get this car up in the air and I'll show you where to look. So now with the car up on the ramp, we can take a closer look at each of the underside components. Starting at the front of the car, two particular areas to focus and zoom in on. First of all, if we come up to this area here, you can see where the steering rack mounts onto the chassis. This particular area around here can be prone to cracks over time because of the steering forces that go through uh, the, the, the chassis here. So take a look, look for any obvious cracks or metal coming away from, from the chassis. Next up, take a look at the two suspension mounts again around this area. Make sure that there's no cracks on any of the metal, uh, which may cause uh, the need for remedial work. As you move down the chassis, check for overall condition, the screwdriver test, check the bodywork, 
make sure that it's strong. Remembering that these chassis tend to rot from the inside out as the water and moisture gets into some of these gaps here, pulls in the bottom and then over time rots the metal through. So don't be afraid to prod the metal hard to make sure that it's solid. As you move back down the chassis, check the condition of all the joints. And the next major stopping point is here with this panel, which we call the T-shirt for obvious reasons. This is one of the prime areas where the TR6 chassis fails. Uh, moisture and road grime comes up to the chassis and gets caught on the top of it, causing it to rot. If, it, if this piece does rot, the integral strength of the chassis is lost. And how that starts to show itself is that because of the weight of the car on the back end of the chassis, uh, the back end will tend to droop. The first thing that you'll probably see on that is door gaps beginning to widen. This is where you can have a look at the door gaps uh, and just take a look down the line and you're looking for a symmetrical constant gap uh, down between the door and the rear wing. Any particular opening up towards the top of the wing is something that you can query and question and look into further. Next, check this particular cross member. It's the cross member that holds the rear trailing arm on the independent rear suspension. All of the load of the suspension is coming through this cross member and you can see where the cross member mounting bolts are here. Make sure again, this is solid, it's good metal and any risk that that may need replacing will also result in the body having to come off the car for remedial repairs. Moving back, you get to the differential area. Again, this is an area where TR6s are prone to failure, particularly the mounting, uh, which is these four pins here, 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 and here. The pins that come through the chassis uh, become uh, rotten through and potentially break due to the forces that the differential puts on it. Uh, this is characterized often by a, a knock on acceleration or a knock as you, as you go from forward to reverse. So if you get that on your test drive, this might be one of the symptoms. Again, a difficult job to do from underneath. The differential has got to come out, the drive shaft's off, prop shaft off. This has got to be removed so that repairs can be done uh, from, from underneath. Finally, look at the back of the chassis area. This area here that goes up to the rear valance receives a lot of the road spray and moisture. Uh, that comes from driving. So again, if moisture gets down here, it's likely to rot down this area. Uh, you can buy repair pieces for this, uh, but again, if the metal isn't solid or there's some risks there, uh, you need to factor that into your purchase. While you're underneath, you might want to run your hand across the engine gearbox joint underneath the overdrive if you have one fitted and also by taking a closer inspection at the rear differential. You may have oil leaks here, and uh, that might be a project for a later date, or it might be a showstopper for you, depending on if you're happy to have a puddle on your garage floor or not. While we're talking bodywork and sills, don't forget to look at the inner sills. So put your hands underneath the car if it's on the ground, have a good inspection. But again, make sure that this piece of metal on the underside of the sills is solid. Uh, if you need to replace that, it could be timely and costly repair work needed. While the car's up in the air, take the opportunity, if you can, to have a look at the suspension. To do that, though, we need to take the wheels off. If you are able to get the front wheel off and take a closer look at the suspension, a few things you should look for. The obvious stuff, things like cracked or broken gaiters, split rubbers around tie rod ends uh, and around the ball joints here. As you move over to have a look at the suspension components, take a look at the rubber bushes. Chances are, if they haven't been replaced in the last five to 10 years, they're going to be cracked and probably in need of replacement. It's not a particularly big job, uh, but it's something that's doable by a DIY mechanic, uh, but it can take uh, some time to be able to do that. Take a look at the condition of the calipers, uh, the pads, the discs, and also the brake lines that feed the calipers. Again, just look for general condition and factor that into your purchase price.
On the rear suspension, it's similar. Take a look for leaks around the dampers, any potential leaks or moisture coming from the disc, maybe from a leaky caliper inside the drum. Uh, and check the general condition of things like the handbrake cables and gaiters around that. Check the springs aren't broken, any issues there that again might incur extra cost. Now we know what we're looking for on the chassis, the next thing to do is take a look at the bodywork. There are certain key areas where you should spend your time and attention to focus on the condition of the car. Starting at the front of the car, the first area to have a look at is along this bonnet edge. That's an area that can be prone to, to rust, uh, particularly from the inside. As, as with most of the metalwork on this car, what you'll find is it will rust from the inside out rather than being evident. And your first evidence of rust will be uh, where you start to get bubbles on the paintwork. Once you've looked at the front bonnet sill or hood sill, Take a look around the headlight. This area here, particularly behind this arch, can get a lot of spray from the front wheels, so it's an area that can rot from the inside. Moving back, take a look at the top of the front wings. This again is an area that can rot from the inside out, having got the spray from the front wheels over, over time. And now while you're at the front, open the bonnet and take a look inside around the battery compartment to see if any acid has been spilling and therefore rotted through the bulkhead. Take a look around the clutch and the brake cylinder, again for fluid that may have spilt over time and caused rot in and around these location areas. You'll note that any water from the front grille and also the bonnet channel here tends to channel its way down. You can probably see here through a hole in the side and also there's a, a tube pipe underneath here. Both of those exit to the inside of this wing. So the water comes down on the inside and will begin to amass around the underside of this front wing here on the sill. This is another area that can rot through. So have a good look at the sill from the inside, along the sill on the outside, and then again at the back in this area covered by the rear wing. This is an area to pay particular attention to, as if the car needs two new sills, uh, that could involve considerable time and labour and cost. Take a cursory look at the bottom of the doors to make sure there's no rot on the bottom of the doors uh, as water has gone through the or past the seals where the window channel is. And then as you move back, take a look at the top of the front wing. This section here where it meets the rear panel, the rear bulkhead is a particular area where, where rut Rust, rust and rot can accumulate, uh, rotting through from underneath uh, from, from the water and spray and debris that comes off the rear wheels. As you move to the back of the car, another prone area like the front hood is the rear boot. Uh, take a look at this area here. This channel can be prone to rust and rot and then glance down and have a look at the valance underneath and make sure that any road spray coming up from the rear over time hasn't rotted through the rear valance. Uh, with those cursory checks, as long as you don't find any alarm bells, you're good to go. Next up, get yourself into the car and start her up. So here we're looking at a 1975 UK model. So we've got the petrol injection system here. Uh, but some of these checks ring true no matter whether you've got carburetors or petrol injection. First up, just listen to the general sound of the engine. Is it noisy? Do you have any tappets uh, that may need adjustment or worst case could start to show excessive wear? Make sure the engine is running smoothly. Uh, any blipping, uh, any popping, any, any non-smooth running could mean that simply the carburetors or the fuel injection needs calibrating or tuning. Generally the ignition parts with these cars are quite cheap. You can replace the whole of the uh, ignition side of the engine for relatively low cost. Uh, so be less worried about that. Be more worried about the general condition of the engine uh, internally. When you're in the engine bay, one of the common issues that people look for here is the wear on the thrust bearings that are within the engine uh, that, that hold the position of the crank relative to the engine block. Why this is important is because over time as you're pushing on the clutch, what you're doing is loading the crank one particular way on the engine. And the only thing stopping it from going forward is a couple of half semicircular 
uh, thrust washers which are located within the sump area. So to check for wear in this area within specification and typically you're looking between uh, 6 and 11 thou, what you need to do is check the end float of the engine. To do this, uh, what you can do for, to get one extreme is get somebody to push their foot onto the clutch and then to get the other extreme you can take a, a crowbar or a lever and push against the front cross member, against uh, the crank pulley to push that back into the engine. What you can then do is use a, a dial test indicator or maybe a digital micrometer if you can get access to measure the movement of the crank relative to the engine block. If the engine is out of specification, that means at the very least you're going to need to review and potentially change the thrust washers. With the engine running, check all your gauges and dials work correctly. So here we have voltage showing higher than 12 volts, so we know the alternator charging circuit is working correctly. In terms of your oil pressure gauge on startup with cold oil, you'd be looking to see something nearer 50. Uh, but once an engine is warm, typically it can run anywhere around 20 or 30. Make sure your fuel gauge works, so there's no repairs needed there. And in terms of temperature, what you're looking for again is does the gauge work properly. There are three uh, thermostats that you can buy for a TR6. Depending on your, your climate, whether it's hot, cold, summer running, winter running, you can pick and choose between a 74 degree thermostat, an 82 or an 88 degree thermostat. This car's got a 74 degree one, hence it looks like it's running slightly lower. I would expect with an 82, the gauge to be in the middle, maybe 88, a little bit higher than that. Check that your tachometer's working okay. Uh, this car's ticking over, it's around, probably a little low actually, probably around 600, 650 RPM. Uh, to the book, they should be idling at around seven to 800 revs per minute. On a test drive, you can make sure that the speedometer works. Uh, and that there's no issues there. Finally, check the condition of the convertible hood. It should lift, it should drop smoothly without need for excessive force. Look for any rips or tears that might mean you need a new hood. And also check the condition of the clear windows, make sure they're clear and not milky from having been stored in a wet condition. If the roof has got any rips or, or unnecessary marks on it, it may mean a more heavy cost to get that replaced. With the visual checks done, now it's time to get on the open road. So on your test drive of any new potential purchase, some of the things you want to look for uh, good steering, you want a sharp steering response, the car should turn well uh, and, and not lag or wallow in its steering. You want good brakes, so when you hit the brakes, the car stops cleanly and the steering wheel remains central so there's no brake drag on any of the front calipers. While you're in the car, check all the controls. So, does the overdrive work? The overdrive should work as a minimum in third and fourth gear on the later models so try driving along in third and if you look at the rev counter here what you should be able to see is when I press the overdrive the revs drop accordingly it should accelerate smoothly through the gears as it does so look out the back just make sure you're not burning any excess oil or getting any blue smoke behind you. Another thing to check for is the heater controls as over time these tend to get stiff. So if you have a look over here, do the knobs pull out and push back easily does the switch pull out and does the fan come on in its two speed modes? Does the water valve on the engine open freely and return freely? Interior lights, does that work correctly? And if the car has got hazard warning lights fitted up here, it's over here on the US models, does that work appropriately? And of course, don't forget to check the horn.
So now you're fully up to speed on what to look for when buying your TR6. Good luck finding a right, the right car for you and uh, I hope you enjoy many happy years of motoring in it. Once again, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please do subscribe. Please do like the video. Please do comment. Love reading the comments and, uh, and replying and getting involved with you all. Until next time.